In 2013, the Yongcheng made history. It was the first Chinese cargo ship to reach Europe through the Arctic. The Yongcheng became a symbol after having taken this mythical route that Beijing came to rename the Polar Silk Road. A symbol for China's new ambitions in the high north. China regards itself rightly as a superpower and that they should have a finger in all parts of the world. China is very well aware that a lot of its uh, economic security is going to continue to be based on developing trade routes through the Belt and Road Initiative. Yet, the Arctic seems pretty far away from Beijing. But Xi Jinping, China's new leader, understood the stakes. Under his rule, the Middle Kingdom would come to meet the roof of the world. When Xi Jinping became president of China, that was the time when China sort of came onto the map. China's need for resources led Xi Jinping to deal with the great Baltic powers, who met him with distrust. What does China want? Beijing's involvement in the High North changes the game. Beijing claims to be a near-Arctic state. There are only Arctic states and not Arctic states. The Arctic's new geopolitics also plays out on the ground, far from capital cities and sleights of hand. The envoys, entrepreneurs and intermediaries are Chinese, but also Norwegian, Icelandic, Swedish, American. The Chinese were actually securing the, their interests. But for us, it was an opportunity to, to be accounted for. China is expanding, but its true ambition remains a mystery. After China Africa, would we soon be talking about the China Arctic? China, so they say, has time on its side, and it no longer conceals its dreams of becoming a superpower. It all starts here, in Shanghai, far from the Arctic. The coastal megapolis of eastern China is under threat as the ice caps continue to melt. Floods often hit the Chinese economic capital. The impact of global warming will be increasingly felt. Shanghai's feet are in water. The Chinese have been using this as an argument for years at international summits. In the name of climate, Beijing sees it as its duty to invest in the Arctic. Beijing this climate argument may be valid, but it omits a great deal about China's intentions in the Arctic. There are three priorities um, for China in the polar region. First of all, security, and that includes traditional and non-traditional security, uh, resources, and in the most broader sense of the word of resources, and science, particularly strategic science. When China starts to show interest in the Arctic, the climate argument presents a considerable advantage with regards to the international opinion. It is legitimate and hard to contest. China insists on this climate danger even more given its geographical distance from the Arctic. Superpowers converge in this region. 
Russia dominates half the Arctic, the United States have Alaska, and their North American ally, Canada. And then there's Europe, through Greenland, a Danish territory, and Norway. China therefore adopts a cautious approach to avoid upsetting the Arctic superpowers. China based a lot of its early Arctic policy on the need to develop scientific cooperation. So I would say scientific diplomacy was very much a first step in a lot of China's Arctic diplomatic engagement. The Chinese Institute for Polar Research is created in Shanghai in 1989 in order to deploy scientific power in the poles. The country's leading scientists work on all fronts, glaciology, oceanography, biology. Yet this institute is not placed under the authority of the environmental ministry, as one would expect, but under that of the Ministry for Natural Resources. In order to establish its scientific legitimacy, China first had to explore the polar regions in the field, or rather, in the seas. As early as 30 years ago, they decide to equip themselves with an icebreaker, proof that they took the whole affair seriously very early on. A used cargo ship was given a mysterious new name, Shuilong, the Snow Dragon. Before the Xuelong uh, goes to scientific ex expeditions, they also have a uh, uh, kind of semi ceremony for the start. And China will make the most of it, turning each appearance of the Xuelong into a public event. For they also need to convince the Chinese people that a bright future awaits them in the high north. This is maybe also part of the uh, awareness building for the Chinese public uh, to have some uh, uh, awareness, not only the Arctic, uh, but uh, the kind of research uh, or the maritime awareness. Endowed with this icebreaker, the Chinese discover a new world. They have a lot to learn. But soon enough, this floating laboratory proves insufficient to serve China's aspirations in the Arctic. But how can they go about in the Arctic, a region whose residents fiercely guard their sovereignty? This archipelago, which for many centuries was a whale hunting haven, opens the Arctic up for the Chinese thanks to a forgotten treaty which resurfaces in 1991. Svalbard became a Norwegian territory a century ago, on the condition that signatory countries were allowed access to engage in commercial or industrial activities. When it was ratified in 1925, France was wary of British and American ambitions. Paris thus invited other ally countries to ratify the treaty. China was one of them. The People's Republic of China inherited all the treaties of the previous regime, and they renounced a lot of them, but they didn't renounce that one. So that gives the right to access the Arctic. In light of this legitimacy, China is finally able to build a base in the Arctic the Yellow River Station. In 2004, the Polar Institute's first researchers disembark in Svalbard and initiate many projects and cooperative endeavors. This whole science diplomacy way of building up certain knowledge about using science as a way to, to build a presence, build relationship, build networks, I think they're uh, the Arctic has been, uh, could be seen uh, as a kind of a testing ground for such an approach. Meanwhile, in the China Sea, Beijing starts showing its disturbing true colors, the ones of an empire developing its navy power. 
a country quite different from the one invited by France to ratify the Svalbard Treaty in 1925. Above all, the Middle Kingdom has become the indispensable factory of the world and Shanghai the planet's largest container port. An overwhelming majority of world trade happens through shipping trade routes, most of which are monitored by the US Navy in order to ensure the free circulation of goods. China has a hard time accepting this stronghold. Nowadays, the route linking Asia with Europe goes through the South China Sea, which is a tense region, and the Suez Canal, which can potentially get blocked. The melting ice caps could offer Beijing alternatives. Three possible routes could shorten the journey by up to 20 days. The Northwest Passage through Canada is too unknown, too complicated because of the ice. The central route through the North Pole is, in a distant future, obviously the shortest, but it is unfeasible as yet due to the ice cap. In the time being, the northern route is the most promising. It goes along Russia and passes just off the coast of Kirkenes, Asia's closest European port. In Kirkenes, from 2010 onwards, Felix Chudi, a Norwegian ship owner, will be the first to prove to the Chinese that this northern road between east and west is viable. In the uh, 4th of September uh, 2010, uh, the Nordic barons left with 41,500 tons of iron ore concentrate to China and arrived 22 and a half days later, uh, which showed that you know, the Northern Sea Route was open for non-Russian vessels with non-Russian cargoes between non-Russian ports. So that was sort of a first. And, and that was quite important because it, sh it showed people this is possible. After this historic journey, Felix Chudi and his associates start to think big. They pay little attention to geopolitical considerations. This, of course, opens up for opportunities uh... To, to, to really look at the year-round uh, transportation of, of all kinds of cargoes, of course. I think it is important to bring forward the fact that we are the closest neighbor to our friends in the States, yeah. in China and uh, Japan. We are the, the closest European neighbor. Yeah. yeah. And then he wrote this book, which is called Through Siberia, the Land of the Future. Felix Judy can now move his project on to the next phase and open a port to receive cargo ships from Asia. With this in mind, he buys an iron mine in Kirkenes. Our purpose of buying the mine was not really the mine itself, which was closed at the time. It was really the port infrastructure uh, which fitted into our vision of what is needed in the Arctic. With the emerging of, of China as the biggest economy and their ambition to communicate uh, through the Northern Sea Route, Chiquines is the first harbor. And also the fact that for Europe, China is more important than US tr trade-wise. And for me as a mayor, it's very important that the Norwegian company, together with Chinese company or other foreign companies, could do something to develop Chiquines as a logistic hub for the, 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 the traffic along the Northern Sea Route. Любой азиатский производитель будет знать, что на ней можно забронировать место, любая фабрика, и можно будет на 40% короче пройти и быстрее приехать из, условно говоря, Шанхая в Роттердам, тогда Северный морской путь состоится. Когда это случится? Мы считаем, что это случится в, в, в текущем десятилетии. The prospect of this new route stirs interest beyond Kirkenes. 
In the middle of the northern Atlantic, Finnefjord on the Icelandic coast is well positioned as a destination for this new commercial route. For Jonas Egelsen, a local official, these Asian cargoes can mean salvation. If you see the roads around here, the infrastructure and everything, you know, this area of the country has been, so to speak, left behind. We are in the closest point to the, you know, the northeastern sea route in addition, and we have access, uh, straight access to harbors in, in in Europe as well, so that makes this excellent choice. And besides, you see the land here behind, it provides an ample opportunity for industries or, you know, the base for the harbor. It's going to be, you know, probably the biggest harbor in Iceland eventually. But this remote region is also a strategic location for NATO, the Western military alliance within which Iceland is a loyal American ally. During the Cold War, NATO had installed a radar station to monitor Soviet submarines in the northern Atlantic. A strategic dimension which could also one day be used for China. But these dreams of ports, which for the time being are merely being studied in offices, raise questions. Only a few dozen ships currently transit through the northern route every year. But what will happen in the future? This issue is troubling for this former Icelandic minister, who is now advisor to the Nordic Foreign Affairs Ministers. The, the, the aim of all the nations to solve matters in the Arctic on the basis of the UN Law of the Sea Convention. The Chinese, they had disregarded this convention in the South China Sea. And therefore, one can speculate if the Chinese become involved in the Arctic, will they respect the Law of the Sea Convention in the Arctic, or will they behave as they are doing in the South China Sea? For the time being, the question remains unanswered, but it raises more questions. For Chinese businessmen now also embark on a quest for Arctic territories. In the early 2010s, billionaire Huang Nubo comes to embody this new upcoming China. He is a poet and a mountaineer, but he mostly spent 10 years working for the propaganda department of the Communist Party's Central Committee before getting involved in real estate business with great success. He sets his sights on two Nordic territories successively. Nubo is about to make an entrance in the life of this Norwegian entrepreneur whose story starts the day he shares dinner with China's ambassador in Oslo. During that dinner, we talk a lot, and he said he have a friend in China. He might want to come and see you. And that was Nubo. I didn't, I didn't know nothing about Nubo before. And he came here, and uh, he said, do you have a property? I said, I have uh, many properties here. And he said, can I see it? Yes, we can. But then we need a boat to see it from the fjord. We jump in a boat and we go for a nice trip in the fjord. And he see the property. And then he said, is it possible to buy? Yes, I said, why not? After five minutes, he said, how much do you want? I said, I don't really know. It's a big property. It's one million square meter. Depends what you want to do. He said he, he liked to build a resort, five-star resort. Very high class. But you have to come to China and see what I'm doing there to understand what I mean. I said, I will come. Don't worry. Ola and his two associates went to China and spent two weeks there at the expense of this mysterious billionaire who was enamored with the Arctic and had been introduced by an ambassador. Well, here, here, uh, uh, 
Her har vi her er det der, ja. hadde vi underskrevet en intensjonsavtale som vi lagde kveld. Ja, det gjorde vi, ja. Ja, ja, ja. ja. Du, 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 du skrev... But the agreement is never enacted. It draws too many negative reactions in the Norwegian press. He is subject to insults. The region's largest daily newspaper calls him a traitor to his country. The Chinese billionaire backs off, and the contract is put on standby. Many people, they talk very badly to me and said, you know, I, I want to give the land to Chinese and this is not good. I said, it's my right to do whatever I want. And I think I, it, in the end, it will be a nice investment and good for Lyng and good for, uh, for Norway. And uh, I cannot see the problem. The outcry against the Chinese billionaire in Norway is replicated in Iceland. It's a question of how you look at a superpower, a military superpower, uh, an authoritarian state, a, a billionaire coming from that state. Of course you ask about these connections. Of course you do. The issue was even more controversial in Iceland, as he was much greedier. The Chinese billionaire tried to get hold of 300 square meters in the north of the island and planned to build a tourist resort with support from these Icelandic entrepreneurs. There were um, some very strange news that surfaced. Uh, one, for example, was about um, him wanting to import a lot of Chinese, up to 3,000 Chinese people, to, to live in Grimstadr. And even it surfaced in the Canadian media that there would be some sort of a military base for China. It's all a the nonsense. I mean, it is a, it's a media hype which fits the kind of model the Chinese are coming, the Chinese are coming uh, to sort of scare people. The interior minister ended up intervening to stop the project in disagreement with the president. We must remember this, that people were crying for investment hoping for investment. And this explains why the municipalities in the north were so eager to have it. But I wanted to be realistic. Internationally, geopolitically, things are happening. The world is on the move. And of course, we have to, to, to analyze this and try to understand it when, uh, when uh, something like this happens. But China bounces back in the Arctic, precisely in the small country of 300,000 people. Beijing made a clever move. It took advantage of the crisis that had hit Iceland a few years earlier, thus ensuring its president would become an unwavering ally. To make sense of this, we must recall the subprime crisis that shook the planet in 2008. It had brought Iceland to its knees. Iceland had been abandoned by all, and President Grimson found himself on the front line to try to save his country. Faced with that situation, direct hostility from Europe, complete uh, no, no interest from the United States. Uh, I wrote a letter to the uh, president of China, and that evolved through a very fascinating uh, diplomatic manual. As I sometimes called it, to a currency swap agreement between uh, Iceland and China, and some other measures, which was important for us to remind Brussels and the European powers that Iceland had other options. And there were no conditions put by the Chinese. That certainly put a very positive impression to the Icelandic government, including President Grimson, who at the time was very interested in opening up Iceland as a gateway, a portal, to the Arctic for non-Arctic states. So the timing was very good for all parties. This alliance is sealed when Iceland becomes the first European country to sign a free trade agreement with China. The Schwellung icebreaker plays a new and crucial role in this improved strategy. It turns into a floating embassy. In 2012, 
it makes the trip from Shanghai to Reykjavik on the Icelandic president's invitation, who plays the China card perfectly, creating a win-win situation. At the end of this trip, the president himself greets the Xuelong's entire crew. When uh, the Chinese research vessel, Su Long, uh, the snow dragon, came to Iceland and I agreed to receive uh, the ship, it was the first time in European history that Chinese scientists explained in an open platform in the presence of ambassadors of all the European countries why they had this scientific mission to the Arctic. <laughs> This cooperation, which aimed to reassure the public opinion by demonstrating China's good intentions, thus flourishes in Iceland, and a cornerstone of a new Northern Lights observation station is even laid. Once built, a few years later, the station would come to draw suspicions. The Icelandic help was invaluable, but it is here in Kiruna, in Swedish Lapland, that China will make a great leap and become a legitimate Arctic actor. In 2013, China is accepted as an observer within the Arctic Council. This is an informal club led by the eight Arctic countries, which has become an indispensable forum for scientific, environmental, and navigational issues. China became the uh, accredited observer in the year 2013. And, uh, we actually we got support by quite a number of countries, including Iceland, which we quite appreciate. China has grown to the point where we simply can't close it out of the Arctic. And that if China is uh, denied some kind of role in the Arctic Council, it will simply treat that as a roadblock to be rooted around. Yet, Beijing's candidacy was not easily granted, for the Arctic countries are sensitive on the issue of their sovereignty in this part of the world. This makes sense given that, amongst its members, it counts Russia, a strong influence in the region, as well as the United States, always on their guard. At that time, I noticed uh, there are some suspicion about uh, what does China want in the Arctic. Uh, and also the Chinese are coming, this kind of China threat mentality. Why should we uh, uh, admit them when they uh, are, are behaving badly in other parts of the world? Uh, I'm pleased to be joined. Uh at the table by our senior Arctic official, Julie Gourlay. For 15 years, Julie Gourlay was the United Alaska. States diplomatic representative at the Arctic Council meetings, and she had come to terms with the idea of welcoming China. It's better to have China under the tent with all of us than not. One of the big fears was that if China were not were denied observer status. They would um, s maybe seek revenge in some ways, like uh, cause trouble for us in other forums, like the UN. That year, six countries are accepted as observers, most of which are Asian. We have agreed, and perhaps in particular on the, the observer issue, where we welcome China, India, Italy, Japan, Republic of Korea and Singapore as new observer states. They accept the principles and the, uh, because they have the sovereignty of the Arctic Council on Arctic issues. China, as a permanent member of the UN Security Council, we do have our obligations and the responsibilities to contribute our wisdom, our resources and know-how. Китаю важно присутствие в Арктическом Совете, потому что, конечно, Китай через статус наблюдателя хочет собирать свою коалицию, с помощью которой он будет влиять на принимаемые решения в Арктическом Совете. Сейчас Китай не влияет на принимаемые решения, он только исполняет. This symbolic victory happens at the exact same time Xi Jinping becomes the new president of China. This changes the world stage. With his climate speeches and his planetary vision of the new Silk Roads, Xi Jinping gives a new direction to this gestating China Arctic project, taking it further than any of his predecessors. Now there is more of a vision of China actually wanting to play a role in the international system of taking up its great power position. 
political level, interest in the Arctic has, has really gone way, way up since President Xi uh, took power. Fondamentalement, ce qui change, c'est cette dimension civilisationnelle. Cette idée que, à travers l'Arctique, la Chine peut apporter quelque chose qui va impacter le reste du monde, aussi bien d'un point de vue scientifique que sur les autres points, économiques, énergétiques et autres. After the subprime crisis, a new crisis unexpectedly placed the Arctic into Beijing's hands. Russia's annexation of Crimea in early 2014. The international community turns against Moscow. Sanctions are imposed. The main goal is to isolate Russia. До Крыма, когда речь еще шла про возможность активного сотрудничества с Западом, конечно, Китай был не на первых полосах. In this new post-sanction world, Vladimir Putin welcomes Xi Jinping with honor. The relationship between the two countries has been gradually warming up since Mao's death. It speeds up as both Beijing and Moscow come under Western criticism. The reluctance that one might expect between two superpowers rapidly dissolves in the face of common interests. Russia needs money and technology, while China needs natural resources in order to sustain its growth. They talk business. Yamal, in the Russian Arctic, changes everything. China is given a golden opportunity to gain a firm and lasting foothold in the high north. Yamal is one of the largest liquid gas sites in the world, and it is crucial for Russia. Beijing thus becomes Yamal's savior on Moscow's demand. Поэтому говорить про то, что смогли бы мы развивать Yamal без Китая, скорее нет, чем да, потому что it was tremendously hyped in Russia at the time. And they were effectively saying, we don't care about you Europeans, we got the Chinese. We don't hear that much about that any longer. I think the Russians are aware of the fact that even if they look very big on a map, and they are very big, um, their economy is smaller than a province of China. Uh, so they are slightly cautious of where this development is going to end up long term. In this forgotten corner of the Arctic, the Chinese can finally demonstrate the extent of their polar commitment. For those who might have been wondering about their aspirations, Yamal provides an answer. The Chinese companies take over 30% of the project and are able to experience the high north on a large scale. Russia should have rejoiced for Yamal, but its identity as a superpower took a serious blow. The Russians generally are very, are not very happy about you know being seen as a, as a, simply the ones who who uh, who develop who who delivers resources to to support uh, China's development as uh, into being a really great power that can challenge challenge the U.S. Right. Can you see that? Me, so China and Russia will have a conflict? Will there be a problem? Russian society has a lot of fears. 
，俄俄罗斯学学者说，那么会不会导致对中国的这种片面依赖啊？片面的依赖中国，这个我认为是过分的疑虑和担忧。Как может быть угрозой пятая часть человечества? Это не угроза, это часть нашей большой семьи. Восточная Азия там очень много дала миру. When the American anthem sounds in Beijing in late 2017, China shows the place it aims to take up in this great Arctic family. Xi Jinping welcomes Donald Trump with great pomp and ceremony. The Yamal site may be large, yet it is but half the size of what is brewing in the American Arctic. China signs a $43 billion mega contract for a liquid gas project in Alaska. the United States' only Arctic state. In 2017, its governor, Bill Walker, had gone to plead the case to Donald Trump. He asked, uh, what could he do? And I said, we need some help with the market. And about two weeks later, I got a uh, notification in my office that uh, President Xi wanted to meet with me. We want cheap, uh, uh, clean energy, and, and so does China. And so we can offer, you know, potentially 100 years of supply of, of, of you know, of natural gas um, that is just stranded at this point. Our market for, is, is Asia, because we're just much closer to Asia, uh, and, and what we have, they need. China expands its power with confidence. Beijing's new boundless ambition take the form of a monumental and planetary project of new Silk Roads, linking China with the rest of the world through land and sea routes, in the name of a declared ideal of mutual benefits. In a mere few years, China changed the game. It all went way too fast. China's power draws concern all the more so given its culture of secrecy. 25 years after having bought a used icebreaker from Ukraine, Beijing now has the capacity to build its own icebreaker, the Shuilong 2. A strong message, given their wish to be taken seriously in the Arctic. Plans for the construction of a nuclear icebreaker are even in the works, which would be an even more important turning point. C'est ce qui permettra à la Chine ensuite de passer à l'étape ultime, c'est-à-dire la construction d'un porte-avions nucléaire, ce qu'elle n'a pas aujourd'hui, et qui lui permettrait, bien au-delà de l'Arctique et de l'Antarctique, de pouvoir avoir une capacité de projection navale dans le monde entier bien plus important, et là, enfin, pour elle, de concurrencer petit à petit les puissances occidentales. Some Chinese researchers realize that this deployment of power could be counterproductive. Sun Kai, a Chinese specialist in Arctic geopolitics, is aware of this and alerts the Chinese authorities. Around 2015 or 2016, at that time, I write several papers advising uh, that China should publish a, a paper on Arctic issues or China's Arctic intention policy because most of the suspicions at uh, the early stages when China is applying st uh, observer status, uh, is, uh, one of the reasons they are seeing is that China do not have a paper, uh, or China's, uh, Arctic, uh, China's intentions in the Arctic are not clear. Today, the State Council Information Office releases the white paper, China's Arctic, Arctic policy. In an obvious attempt to appease, Beijing takes a step. Thank you. A white book on its Arctic policy is presented to the international press in January 2018. Beyond climate issues, it mainly mentions its Polar Silk Road project and asserts its wish to exploit Arctic resources. 
the Arctic white paper is actually a sign of more self-confident, somewhat more ambitious and more risk-taking Chinese uh, Arctic approach or Chinese Arctic diplomacy. The most important thing about that document is what's not in there. It doesn't talk about China's military strategic interests in the Arctic. Some of those ports, well, those ports could be used for dual-use activities, civil and military, and so could facilitate, uh, for example, being a, um, a port base for a submarine. In the heart of the Northern Atlantic, NATO's preserve, the Arctic map would have to be revisited. Imagine submarine bases behind Finnefjord in Iceland, where the call for investors is about to begin, or in Lingen in Norway, with billionaire Nubo and his tourist resort in a fjord. But it is here, in Lysikil, on the Swedish west coast, that tensions are going to escalate. This small town, which has been weakened by a company's departure, witnesses the return of Chinese businessmen on a quest for large land transactions. Tommy Nicholson, a consultant, remembers the day when a group of Chinese people came into his life. He was a small Chinese guy. He could invest for 50 million euro, and he had his daughter with him, and then an assistant. I picked him up here at Kutia Tower in, in Göteborg and brought them up to Lysekil, where I have planned meetings with the community. At that time, it was purely investment in Lysekil, in the existing port. Quite small investment. Uh, the Chinese thought it was too small for them. But at the same time, we showed them the premium raft outside Lysekil. When they saw that place, that surface around that, and they, wow, uh, will it be possible for us to look in, to, to make a pre-study, if it's possible to, to create some like, like a deep port here for, for, for container traffic? I heard some rumors from friends or, or locals here. This former Navy officer reckons that Sweden is being naive with regards to this port project. I th found it very uh, surprising uh, with his plans. But anyways, I started to check things and, and dig a little bit in my sources. I got to know who were behind this. So we located two big Chinese companies both with links to the uh, Communist Party. Magnus Sederholm, who suspects that this project could serve Chinese military interests, publishes an opinion piece which is taken up by many newspapers. Its echo is immediate and widespread, and it baffles the Chinese embassy. <laughs> We have no interests for an investment that we not can also control in the long run. We have also seen, for example, in Greece, where there is China's ownership of a harbor that, that also have been used to make an impact on Greece policy development. So we, we do not want that sort of situation in our country. This mistrust extends to the scientific projects that had opened the Arctic up to the Chinese. The Icelandic man who had once been the unfortunate intermediary for a Chinese billionaire knows this well. He is involved in the construction of the Icelandic Chinese Observatory, whose first bricks had been laid a few years back. 
This center is now drawing attention because of the laser that the Chinese want to fit inside. Suspicions arise that it might be used for more than mere observation of the night sky. This room is the lighter room. We will be opening the ceiling or the roof, and then the laser beam will be sent up uh, all the way up to as far as 150 kilometers up into the sky. China has uh, a research station in Svalbard. It has a, a brand new one in Iceland. And of course, it uses its uh, icebreaker, the Shui Long, as a scientific research platform in the Arctic. So there's certainly um, uh, lots of concern that those, those uh, research stations are dual use um, for, for military and, and uh, other purposes, uh, intelligence gathering purposes. At the Arctic Council in May 2019 in Finland, this buildup of suspicions leads the traditional consensus that had previously prevailed in the subdued forum to fall apart. Despite his engaging smile, Mike Pompeo, Donald Trump's Secretary of State, catches everyone unawares. It was as if the Americans had suddenly woken up and realized that beside Africa, the Arctic was also one of China's targets in its race to become a world superpower. Beijing claims to be a near-Arctic state, yet the shortest distance between China and the Arctic is 900 miles. There are only Arctic states and not Arctic states. No third category exists, and claiming otherwise entitles China to exactly nothing. It, it was a very, very aggressive um, speech that uh, had never been given before in an Arctic Council setting. There, there had never been anything like that. Our Pentagon warned just last week that China could use its civilian research presence in the Arctic to strengthen its military presence, including our deployment of submarines, including deployment of submarines to the region as a deterrent against nuclear attack. For China, from a nuclear security point of view, uh, the Arctic is China's vulnerable backdoor. The Arctic Ocean is important for China. If China could get a um, nuclear missile um, submarine under an Arctic ice, that would provide a second strike deterrence for China. Besides, the Chinese have weapons that are perhaps much more efficient, their financial power. Their response to Mike Pompeo's speech is simple. They retreat from the giant Alaska LNG project with its $43 billion promise. Alaska returns to a standstill. The biggest question about the future of the Arctic in the next 30 years is not what China will do and what Russia will do, because we know they will continue to cooperate in energy and resources and, and, and shipping. The big question is what will the United States do? Will they continue to be largely passive? The Chinese Arctic future will probably hinge on this question of commitment. Where are the actions beyond words? Greenland alone summarizes this stake. China is now interested in Greenland, with an eye on its enormous rare earth metals and other mineral reserves. Greenland is a symbol for China's ambitions. An immense autonomous territory under the Danish flag it is half the size of the European Union. Its population counts barely 56,000 inhabitants, most of whom are Inuit, and it dreams of emancipation. But at what price? For the Greenland, the enjeu is to become tout simplement independent. For the Chine, the idea is to support this independence to change the balance. It could certainly be a game changer if, if, if China were able to. Um to have a lot of presence in the Arctic and establish 
uh, the ability to, to engage in lots of economic development activity, um, it, would be felt, uh, it would be felt around the world. Close to Narsuk in the south, the Kwanasut mining project bears the mark of this shift. It is rich in uranium and rare earth metals, over which China already practically has a global monopoly. These rare earth metals are vital for environmental transition technologies. While the aim was to break up China's monopoly by exploiting these rare earth metals here in Greenland, a Chinese state company took charge of this project, which may take decades to come to fruition. No matter, Beijing takes its time in the Arctic, time that the other countries did not take. But do these other countries even have an Arctic strategy? If you talk about countries investing in projects, in Greenland, you see the Chinese interest. No US investments, no European investments. There's only one way of preventing Chinese monies in Greenland. That's if you invest yourself. But uh, until today, we haven't seen any US investments or European investments. At the foot of the Kwanasut mountain, on the edge of the Narsuk Fjord, a young Inuit shepherd is opposed to the mine that will pollute his pastures. He lives alone with his sheep. Sometimes they get lost in the mountain, and he likes to get lost with them. He didn't go searching for anyone on the other side of the world. He would simply like to believe that his future is in his own hands.